All right, you guys ready to get in? We are going to close out our Battle Before the Battle series. And what I wanna talk to you today is I wanna talk to you about unseen victories. Unseen victories. One of the reasons why I am confident in serving God is because what I know about God is that he is, I'm gonna give you a nice little theological word here. He is omniscient, omniscience. He knows all things from beginning to end. He's not caught off guard. He's not like, oh my goodness, I didn't know that was gonna happen today. God has this whole thing planned out from start to finish. And the other thing you need to know is that Satan is not omniscient. Satan is not aware of what's gonna happen from beginning to end. If he did, he would have never allowed Jesus to give his life up on that cross. Because he'd have said, no, 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 that's, that's completely opposite of what I'm looking for. He's fishing around because he doesn't know beginning from the end. He's been on this earth for a while now, and so he's strategic. He knows how to play on the hearts of men, but he doesn't see the beginning from the end like my God does. My God sees beginning from end. He holds it all together through the power of his word. And so I am confident that God not only sees the battles that you are going to face in the coming weeks, months, years, and decades of your life should Jesus tarry, but he knows the victories and he is bringing you right now through a process that is gonna position you to walk in that victory. Church, there are victories that God has planned for you that go beyond what you ever could have thought or imagined. This isn't just empty rhetoric. This is exactly what we're gonna study in the word of God today as we look at the battle between David and Goliath. So here we go. We're gonna jump into it. Turn with me, first of all, to Romans chapter eight and verses 28. We're not gonna stand quite yet. I got another verse for standing, but I just wanna use this as a springboard. Because this is one of those verses that many of you may know in part, and it's good in part, but you really need to have the full picture of what the word is saying to really hold fast to what is being said here. Let me show you. Most of the time when you hear people quote Romans 8, 28, they'll say, and we know that God works all things together for good. And they just say, amen. But doc, that's not where it ends, does it? That's not the end. Because if it was just, we just know that God works all things together for good, then Michael, we could just do whatever we wanna do and just trust that in the end, even if I screw up, even if I go and do my own thing, that God's gonna work it all together for good. And see, there's a lot of frustration in people's lives whenever we live like that because they're like, well, I see no redemptive qualities of this relationship. I see no reason why, you know, this job turned out this way, why this house turned out this way, why this business deal went this way. The Bible does not say that God will just take whatever you decide to do and turn it together for good. Just go ask Israel. They had a whole 40 years of wandering around because they decided what they wanted to do was better than what God had told him to do. Let's actually read the verse in context here. Romans 8, 28, I'm reading out of the ESV. It says it like this. It says, and we know, we know, not we think, but we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and those who have been called according to his purpose and plan. That's totally different. It's not just he works all things together for good. It's gonna be all right. I can make my own choices and he'll work it out in the wash. No, no. He works all things together for the good of those who love him. And Jesus said that if you love me, you're gonna keep my commandments. So that's a whole nother level now. Now we're talking about listening and obeying and then doing what God has called me to do. And in that confidence, I can go walk in that and say, well, he's gonna work all that together for good. Those who have been called according to his purpose, it's not just my good ideas, but it's my God idea. It's my God idea that I'm looking for that I can hold on to a confidence and say, God's gonna work that out in time and his purpose and his way and his plan. It will work for an eternal reward. Guaranteed, you can hold on to it or... Because we have choice, you can choose to go do what you wanna do. But let me venture a little bit away from the word and Brandon might be able to correct some of these numbers for me here, but I just did a little light study. This isn't like full-blown fact check, but let's just say some rough numbers. Uh, as of recent, it said that if you're gonna choose to go do what you wanna do on your own, business world, if you're gonna start up a small business, within the first year, 20% of those businesses are gonna fail. If you go do what you want to do, this isn't God gave me this. This isn't just, well, this is a good idea. So I'm gonna go do my good idea and I'll figure out if God actually wanted me to follow it or not afterwards. If you just go step out on the good idea on your own, statistically, within the first year, 20% of those businesses are gonna fail. fail and within the second year, 70% of the businesses fail. 20% by the second year, it's done. You can try it, try it on your own. There is 30% somewhere over there and I don't know how much of that would say, well, those are the people that actually followed God. We could argue that later. But nonetheless, you have 30% that will succeed after two years. How about marriage? 
You guys are kind of familiar with the marriage statistics, right? You could go do what God has called you to do, to go find the spouse that God has purpose for your life, or you could go find a good thing, a nice little honey that looks right, that makes the right amount of money, <laughs> that kind of connects with you as far as your chemistry and your styles and preference go. You could go try the good thing, but again, the statistics are kind of working against you there. It's saying that 35 to 50% of marriages, regardless of if you're in the church or outside the church, are going to fail the first time around. And by the second time, it's 60 to 70%. You can try to go do the thing on your own. God gives you that free will to do it, or you can choose the better way to step into a covenant with a man or woman that God has purposed for your life. And when you step in it in that way, even in the hard times, even in the times when you say, you know what? She ain't treating me the right way. You know what? He ain't like manning up the way that he needs to man up, but that's all right. I'm not in this relationship because of this person. First and foremost, I made a covenant with God and then I made the covenant with this individual. And because I first connected with the Lord, I will stick it out because I know that God's gonna work it all together for good because this was his plan. This wasn't my plan. Let's go to one more since this is our two-year anniversary. Church plants, praise Jesus. Within the first five years of a church plant, it's going, half of them are going to fail. Half of them will close down within the first five years. And what I find even more disturbing than the first five year statistic is the fact that right now in America, the average church size is roughly 67 people. We used to be at 100. We've kind of dwindled it back down to 67. What's really frustrating about that is, is that Barnum said that on average, that's enough people to bring in enough money to finance a pastor and a building that if those people will give, that's enough. And so what I see in that is that there are pastors that have forgot the call and they've stepped in and now they're just doing their own thing and they're comfortable. They got their money, they got their family taken care of, they got a building and everything like that. And so they're doing their own little thing and they're happy and they're content and they just become complacent. Church, we can step out and do what we want to do find the good thing, or we can choose to step in to the God thing. When you choose to step into the God thing, Philippians 1, 6 says that we can be sure of this, that he who begun the good work sees it through into the end. If God begun the good work, then he sees it through the end. If you, in your frustration or in your great wisdom and intelligence begins the work, there's no guarantee that I'm just gonna make it all work out for you. But if God works it out in the beginning, he will see it through into the end. The writer says, I am sure of this. This isn't just a, a possibility. You can take it to the bank. And he does that because he is a covenant making and a covenant keeping yeah. God. Can I talk to you guys a little bit about the victory that we find in the covenant with Jesus Christ? I wanna invite you to stand with me and let's read Romans, uh, not Romans, Revelation. Ooh, you know it's good when you're preaching out of Revelation. This is another one of those verses. If you grew up in my generation, there was a famous worship leader that he took uh, this verse that we're about to read here and he gave us a portion of the scripture, but he didn't give us the whole thing. And somehow that permeated the church with this anthem of incomplete theology. And I still like the song. I just wish he would have completed the thought. The hymns, many of the hymns are, are rich in this, man. They, it's like they get part of the scripture and the truth, but they kind of miss small portions of it. And God help us with some of the stuff that's written brand new today. Like they forgot to incorporate the Bible at all. So Jesus, bring us back to your word. But let's read the verse in its entirety. I'm over here on Revelation chapter, where's my note say? Chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And I'm going to start in on verse 10. Revelation chapter 12 and verse says, uh, 10, it says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. He says now, because we serve a God that is always the God of the now. It's not, I'm going to get there eventually. The Bible actually says that before man ever sinned, before the foundations of the world were laid, that the lamb of God was slain. God was already making preparations before you ever made your first move. He says now, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his, of the, of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, talking about the devil, who accuses them day and night before our God. And now listen here on verse 11. This is gonna be the launching point for the message today. It says, we have overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. The blood of the lamb is strong. The word of the testimony is powerful, but there is a response from the heart of the people that we will not love our lives and be afraid of death. Come on, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence in this place today. 
Lord Jesus, I thank you for the sacrifice that you made so that we could connect with you once again, that we could come before you with clean hands and a pure heart, not done under our own might or our own power, but God, it was through your sacrifice, King Jesus, that your blood washes us white as snow. And God, I thank you for this opportunity to know you. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for the breath in my lungs. Where would I be without you? You are my song and you are my joy. You are my hope and you are my peace. Apart from you, I have nothing. But God, with you, I have everything. Our desire today is to know you and be known by you, to love you and to serve you in the way that best suits your purpose and plan. Let your kingdom come and your will be done here and prosper as it is in heaven. We invite you, Holy Spirit, now to come and speak. Your servants are listening. Amen. Amen. Jesus' name, amen. 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 (laughs) Praise God. He says we've overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of the testimony, and we did not love our lives so much that we would fear death. Now let's take that in context of David's story as he's stepping forward to face Goliath. The first battle that David continually had to fight and win was this battle of fear. Don't be so foolish as to think that David was just running in blind. I think a lot of times what we could look at and say, well, this is just a little 14-year-old guy. He doesn't really know better. He's just, you know, it's the typical 15-year-old just running in, you know, shoot for it first, aim later, jump, and then look down and see what's going on. I told you last time that uh, in hospitals, they would say that the last thing you hear a kid say before he ends up in the hospital is, hey guys, watch this. And then the arm is broken. <laughs> But that's not David's confidence. That's not the way that David overcome, overcame the fear. He wasn't afraid of death. He would run right there towards the lion and towards the bear, and he would gladly kill them if they ever tried to come against the thing that he was entrusted with. What's interesting about um, the lion and the bear, they say there's only three things that hunt people. It's other people, it's lions, and it's bears. That's the only three things on the planet right now. I don't know about T-Rexes or anything like that, but (laughs) as far as the animals that we have today, it's just bears, lions, and other people. And so David is saying that I'm standing in the face of one of the only things that can actually hunt me down and kill me. And I will take it down, not under my own might or my own strength, but by the help and the hand of God. He overcame a fear in the natural, but then there was the word of the testimony. And what's powerful about David's word and testimony is that despite the fact that he had done a lot of great things in such a short period of time, he did not look at that as his source for strength, as his platform for why he deserved to do the things that he did. He stood boldly on the word of God and the word of God alone. And then he did not feel failure. There's always this stepping out into the unknown. I just showed you guys some statistics that if I step out and do things on my own, 20 to 70%, my business chance is gonna fail. There's about a 50-50 chance that my marriage is going to fail. This church, you don't know, unless I'm doing things according to the word of God, David stood firm on the covenant that he had with God. That's what I wanna talk to you about this morning. Can we talk a little bit about covenant? Are you guys familiar with the power of the covenant that God has made with us as his people? David wasn't running just as a good idea or as just a bold little 15 year old coming after him. He came with the confidence in knowing that the covenant that he has with God guaranteed the victory. Guaranteed the victory. So here we go. Let me give you a simple working definition of covenant here. You can find other ones that you might like, but I think this will suit the purpose. It says a covenant is simply this. It's an unchangeable, divinely imposed legal agreement between God and man that stipulates the conditions of their relationship. That's a pretty good one, yeah? (laughs) It's a covenant that is unchangeable because Numbers 23, 19, Moses says, he said, God is not a man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. He says, and it will be done. He speaks and it will be fulfilled. Guaranteed, you can take it to the bank. It is an unchangeable covenant. God doesn't make it, make it a deal with man and then say, oh, I don't like the way that's working out. Let me go a different direction with it. When he says it, he's a covenant making and he's a covenant keeping God. David stood on the reality of the covenant that he had with him. And you read this, if you wanna turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm actually gonna do it right here. 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45. 
Nope, I lie. Verse 26. It says, David asked the man standing around him, he says, what's gonna be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What I love about this story here that you may see or maybe you've overlooked it is David never even acknowledges Goliath by name. Every time he goes back to covenant, it's a Philistine. This isn't part of Abraham's lineage. This is not a part of the covenant that was made with Moses. This is just some old Philistine that's got covenant with some false God out and God only knows where he's not in covenant with the same God that I'm in covenant with. And then he goes in and he makes it personal. He says, this is an uncircumcised Philistine. It's bad enough that you came from your mama and daddy and they weren't in the lineage that I'm in. But even just you personally, you have no connection. I don't care how big your stick is. I don't care how big your shield is. I don't care how many battles you've won or how long you've been fighting. You don't carry the covenant that I carry. David comes in there with boldness of this thing. Let me give you, there's a ton here. I'm like sitting here processing all this with Lauren. I'm like, I don't know if I can cram all this into a small message. Here we go. Can I give you five covenants that we find in the word of God? The five covenants. Vincent, what's the first covenant? Noah. Come on, we got some Bible school students over here. No, don't show them. <laughs> I was so proud of him. I thought, this is my boy. We're about to go to Mexico together. I gotta know, I gotta be fighting hand in hand with a guy that knows his covenants. Matthew. <laughs> covenant number one is Noah. What's powerful about the covenant with Noah, first of all, you, you look at the situation that Noah just went through and God says, I'm never going to flood the earth again. And you say, well, that's a good idea, but we serve a super creative God. So it's like, if he wants to just go and destroy the earth some other way, he's still got fire, he's got wind, he could just like do the Thanos snap and you know, make some <laughs> untold number of people disappear. Like it's not, it's not so much about destroying the water. What he's saying through the covenant with Noah, he says, I'm never going to divinely intervene in such a way that I wipe out all of creation and just bring it back to one person again. Instead, my relationship now with, with you is gonna be of, of this way. I'm going to always give you an opportunity for redemption, but you are going to make choices. Because see, in the past, what was happening is people were just doing what they wanted to do, irregardless of what God was saying. And God just said, no, we're gonna restart with Noah and his family. But then what happens? Like within the very next 24 hours, Noah's over there screwing up with his daughters and it just all goes downhill from there. So he's like, okay, we're not gonna do that anymore. It's gonna be the start of this covenant. Number two, now, we already got it up on the screen. You did good, Matthew. I'm just giving you a hard time. Number two is the Abraham covenant. So we start out really broad. This is the way God's gonna interact with all of humanity. Never gonna flood the earth again. Second one is Abraham. It's a two-part covenant. He says, I'm gonna make you into a great nation, Abraham. Abraham's gonna be the father of many sons. You've heard the song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, but there was going to be one that was going to turn into a great nation. And then the second part of that blessing was, I'm gonna bless all the people of the world through you. So now we got this really big open space here, never gonna destroy the earth. I'm gonna bless people through Abraham. I'm gonna make Abraham into a great nation. And then we get into number three, the Mosaic covenant. And with Moses now, he identifies the lineage of Abraham that is going to be the people that are set apart unto God. And this is the Israelites. These are the people that Moses is now leading. And this is the line that David comes from, from the tribe of Judah. I'm sorry, from the tribe of Benjamin. He comes forth. And what you have here with David is David is looking at, at Moses and he's looking at the covenant that God made with Abraham. And he says, I stand on these things. I have the enemy looking at me right now. And he's telling me I'm going to be defeated. I'm going to be enslaved. And my people are going to be murdered. But my God says that through covenant, my people will be blessed above all other people, that we are a chosen people. We are destined for a promised land. And greater is he that is in me than this giant that stands before me. David, it wasn't just words for David. Although those words got him all the way to the courthouse of the king because he was so bold with it. Can I tell you, we are living in a time and age where if people will stand firm on the covenant and the understanding of who they are in Christ, the world has no other choice but to take notice of that power and authority. Covenant is the theological glue that binds God's promises to our assurance that what God says will come to pass. The covenant that we have with God is the theological glue that looks, so when the rest of the world says, you're crazy, why do you act the way that you act? Why do you think the way that you think? It's because I stand in covenant with a God that does not lie. When he says it, I can take it 
to the bank. What David says in response to this covenant in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 45, he's looking at Goliath. He says, you come against me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel. Notice how many times he's bringing him back to the one that he stands in covenant with. You don't come against me. Church, when you guys are coming against opposition, when that doctor gives you that bad report, when life is looking bleak, you look right in the face of that devil and say, you're not coming against Tyler. No, you're standing against the creator of the universe, the one that has called me by name and has imprinted his name upon me, that has made me a new creation in him. He says, you're coming against the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver into my hands and I will strike you down and cut your head off. This day, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. What does our life look like when we stand in covenant? We do supernatural things that nobody ever looks at and says, wow, look what Robert can accomplish. That is one sharp dude right there. No, we look at it and it's in our weakness that he's made strong and it says, that guy has something that I need to have. That's how we live a life that goes and invites others to embrace Jesus. It's when we stand in the covenant and we do the things that we should never be able to do and we do them on the basis of knowing that we are serving a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. He says, this very day, I'll give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword, it's not by that spear that you're carrying, it is the Lord that saves for the battle is the Lord and he will give it into your hands. This was the confidence that he has. This is the way that he overcomes the fear. He stands on the basis of covenant. And so now I feel you looking at me and you're saying, but pastor, I'm not Jewish and I'm not David. <laughs> so where is my covenant? Where is my covenant? If you want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter one, I'm gonna do it with you. See how long it takes you. You there yet, Robert? Matthew chapter one. On my page, it's page 991. <laughs> From Matthew 1 all the way to Revelation, that's your new covenant. Amen. Amen? Jesus, the Gospels, it's Jesus fulfilling over 300 prophecies of the Old Testament and not eradicating the Old Covenant, but fulfilling the old covenant so that, because remember the covenant cannot be changed. God can't say, okay, well, but it can be fulfilled. And so Jesus fulfills the Old Testament covenant and now establishes the New Testament covenant. And so what you see is he's beginning to give you the groundwork for this New Testament covenant. And if you don't know what you have, you can't tap into it. From Matthew one all the way to the end of Revelation is basically the terms and agreements. You know how we never read the terms of agreements on iTunes? You guys have basically like given your entire family life and all that you own to Apple or <laughs> a million different companies because you just click agree. I think a lot of times we do that as Christians. I think a lot of times we just, preacher gives a good message and it sounds like, yeah, hell sounds like it would be a terrible place to go, pastor, sign me up. I agree, boop. And we never read the terms of agreement. We never understand what's required of us. And furthermore, we never understand what's available to us. Can I give you, I have uh, what my sister calls uh, extreme iPhone tendencies. Extreme iPhone tendencies. I don't know if there's anybody else in the room like this, but I run with no case on the back and no screen protector on the front. We operate, I know, I see some of you guys, it's just a you, you crazy person over here. <laughs> extreme iPhone, just sitting there running around like a wild man. This phone's about two years old and it looks nice right now because I discovered something about the terms of agreement that I had with our phone carrier. Because maybe about three months ago, I may have dropped this thing and it was one of those like where you drop it and you go to reach for it and as you're reaching for it, you somehow smack that thing all the way across the room. <laughs> it's like it might've landed on a pillow, but somehow I just slapped it into a bed of rocks, like trying to grab it in midair. Uh, so needless to say, I cracked the back of the phone and iPhone being iPhones, like, oh, you got a crack in the back of the phone. Well, we're gonna charge you about 85% of what the phone cost to repair that. So I just put a cheap little case on the back and I'm walking around with my busted iPhone not really thinking much of it until we go to our carrier store and they say, you do realize that you have protection over that phone. I said, oh, really? So what does that protection include? It says, we will take this phone for a very small fee, a couple bucks, 
and we'll just give you a brand new one. He will take the broken things <laughs> and give you something brand new. This covenant that we have with God is useless if you don't use it. So many followers of Christ have like just hit the accept button on the terms of agreement without ever knowing what they have access to. And so the enemy who has absolutely taken time to study this word does whatever he can to bring confusion, to steal, kill, and destroy the power and the authority that you have under the covenant that we find in the New Testament. Can I just read you a little bit of the terms of agreement that you have as a child of God under this new covenant. First of all, let's lay the foundation. Paul says very clearly in, in uh, Galatians 3.8, he says, there's neither a Jew or a Gentile nor a slave or a free person nor a male or a female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So this is no longer like, well, did I, I need to go check a 23 and meal real quick, pastor, and make sure I came from Abraham and from Moses. Hey, none of that. He's saying there's no longer a Jew or it's not about your race. It's not about your ethnicity. It's not about the gender. It's not about any of that stuff. When you've made the decision to follow Christ, we are now one in the covenant that we have with Christ. And as covenant people in the New Testament, what we find is one of the things I love, I'm gonna give you just a couple. You're gonna have to spend your own time studying out the New Testament. But some of the things that you have access to as a follower of Christ in this New Testament covenant, what you have is first and foremost, you have forgiveness of sin. And you don't understand the magnitude of that until you really just take an honest look at yourself and realize I probably, if I go back and put my life against the word of God, I couldn't get through an entire day without sinning. And yet I serve a God that has chosen to forgive my sins. He didn't just choose to forgive the sins. Through justification, he has chosen not to remember the sins. Now this is huge because some of you guys choose to have a better memory than God. Some of you guys have been forgiven of the sins of your past, but you still live under the bondage and the heaviness of that past. And you bring it to God and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. I have chosen to cast that thing as far as the East is from the West. This is powerful because in the Old Testament, the covenants that they had, they had to kill an animal on a regular basis. I'd be over there at Wild Fork like every single day <laughs> having to get another animal. I guess you have to go to the barn. They had to be alive. So... <laughs> They had to kill something. There was always a ritual. There was always a process. They were just continually in this place of begging for forgiveness, killing of an animal, and they were never, to ha they were never able to have this close relationship with God because there was always the barrier of sin present. But under the new covenant, how many knows? Christ came and he became the one and only sacrifice that we needed, that his blood now washes away the sins. I always try to emphasize that whenever we take communion together, that it doesn't cover it, it washes it away. Because the implication sometimes, if I cover something, see, when I tell my kids to go clean their room, they know how to cover the mess. They don't necessarily remove the mess. And so if I know the mess is there, then you're constantly worried about, is Robert, is Chris, is one of these guys going to see the mess if they get too close to me? And so what we do as followers of Christ, we try to keep everybody at arm's length. I don't want you to get too close because there could be some imperfections there that I'm not ready for you to encounter yet. But you stand in the boldness and the confidence of your new covenant that the old has been passed away and behold, you have been made new. You have been washed in the blood of Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. You have been justified through Christ Jesus. There's now no separation between us and God. There's a scary portion of scripture in the Old Testament when we're looking at Old Testament covenant where at one point God is like, Moses, how about we just wipe everybody else away and we'll just start back with your family. I'm all done with these guys. They've fought against me since I got them out of Egypt. They actually wanted to go back and be slaves because they like garlic and leeks better than my, than my manna. And Moses had to contend for Jesus, for God just to even keep them here on the face of the earth. But now Paul says this, that he says, I am convinced that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. You have a new covenant where nothing can separate you. You have been made righteous. Righteousness, a good, another good theological term there is we are in right standing with God because of Christ Jesus. There's no need to come in timidly and like, oh my Lord, I hope he doesn't bring up this problem. We come in boldly as sons and daughters of the living God. We just recently got a new piece of furniture and I thought about my kids coming in boldly. If any of you came into my house, I would assume that you would walk in and maybe you'd come and you just take a nice little seat. My little three-year-old, I swear she like cuts some Dominique Mociano like Olympic thing where she does like two cartwheels and a backflip and just like lands into the, <laughs> into the new couch like, <laughs> welcome to my house. Like she just, she, she makes herself at home. 
through righteousness, that's the expectation. When you come in on Sunday mornings, it's not like, man, I've really messed up this week. I, don't, I hope I don't catch on fire when I get close to the presence of the Lord. He comes and he takes you just as you are, ready with love and forgiveness. You've been given the Holy Spirit, the one that now teaches you, empowers you, and prays through you as you use that heavenly language. Jesus said that it was better that he goes so that in this new covenant, you now have a Holy Spirit that dwells within you. He had Jesus walking beside his disciples. You now have Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. We no, have, we no longer have an imperfect high priest like what they had in the Old Testament, but we have the son of the living God sitting right next to his Father, interceding on our behalf so that nothing the enemy brings as an accusation against us will ever permeate the ears of our God. Because Jesus says, I've already taken care of it. The Holy Spirit working in you and through you. Come on, this is good stuff right here, y'all. You have a new covenant that the Holy Spirit gives you the fruit of his spirit. It is his love. You have supernatural joy. Because of the Holy Spirit, I do not have to live oppressed by depression. I do not have to live oppressed by fear and worry because the fruit of the spirit is an everlasting joy. I have a supernatural peace that goes beyond understanding. I have a patience like none of us understand. I feel like Lauren is quite patient with me for I am very hyper and sporadic at times. She's patient, I heard that. <laughs> but she ain't patient like my God. You think of the billions of people on this planet and every day, probably every second of every day, there are thousands of people making offenses against him. Many of them. The Bible says that before we come into the revelation knowledge of Jesus, that we are enemies of God. And yet in his patience, he chooses to allow us to live. Church, you need to give yourself some patience. You need to give yourself a little bit of room. I don't think we serve as angry of a God as what some people have kind of taught us to believe, that we have a, a God that is slow to anger. Doesn't mean there's no anger, but it's slow. It's really slow. We have a patient God and the Holy Spirit empowers us with patience, with kindness, with goodness, with faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You have power and authority over this new covenant. In this new covenant, you have power over your own body. This is the deal. A lot of people, it's just like, well, I can't help myself. This is just the way my body functions. No, Paul says that I take my body into submission on a daily basis. I don't ask my body how I'm doing, how I'm feeling, how I'm going to respond. I tell this mortal flesh, how it's going to be today. We don't always take advantage of that, but it's absolutely available under this new covenant. Not just that, but there is no, it doesn't matter how much you've seen in Hollywood, there is no such thing, <laughs> we can fight about this later, but there's no such thing as a demon-possessed follower of Christ. Now you can be oppressed, there can be some attacks that come against you, but greater is he that's in you. If the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you, there's no room for another spirit to come in there and force you to do something. You have a new covenant that you stand in power and authority and there's nothing that the enemy can stand against you with. Come on. And then the final thing is you have, a, you have authority over sickness. We used to play this game of, oh, if it be thy will, Jesus, that I be healed. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the God that heals. In fact, even before he went to the cross to make provision for salvation, he went to the whipping post. Yes. And the Isaiah looked towards that moment for our salvation. He said, by his stripes. The stripes didn't come at the cross. The, cri the stripes came at the whipping post before he ever got to the cross. He said, by the stripes, we are healed. And Peter looks back at that same moment. And he said, it was at that moment. By his stripes, we have been healed. Church, you have a new covenant in that moment where God's will is that you are healed. And then you have eternal life. There is a promise of a new Jerusalem that is being established here on earth that we will call home, that what the Israelites had to look forward to was a temporary dwelling place that was always gonna be attacked by the enemy. And God is saying, I'm bringing you into a paradise, into a place where you will rule and reign along my side here on earth. Could I just challenge you over these next couple of weeks to take time and study the terms and, agree and agreements that you have right here in this New Testament? There's so much available to you that you're not getting to tap into yet. If you don't understand what this book has for you, we serve a covenant. And what the writer of Hebrews says, and we're gonna actually be doing a study of Hebrews uh, starting this week in our Bible groups, uh, Hebrews 6 and in Hebrews 8. What the writer says is he says, this is a greater covenant than what David and Elijah and Moses and all these other guys had. He said there was an imperfection there in those covenants because there was always God says, I'm going to do this. And then man, I expect you to do this. But in the new covenant, 
what God did. Don't let this go over the heads. Let me simplify it as much as I can. What God did was he said, I'm not making this covenant between me and an individual. I'm making it between me and myself. So the way that he says it is, it's God the Father saying, I'm sending my one and only son as the one that I will make the covenant with. And he will go and he will fulfill the Mosaic covenant that the Israelites couldn't fulfill and he will live a perfect life. And then he will lay that perfect life down so that we no longer have to make sacrifices to be made distinct among them because Jesus made the sacrifice. So now the covenant has been weighed between God and himself and then we just get to be beneficiaries of it. Amen. Come on, there's so much power in this new covenant because it's not, it's not contingent on Vincent being obedient or not obedient. The covenant remains strong throughout every season of every moment of our life. This is the confidence that we have that we can stand. If David could stand on a lesser covenant and look at a giant and say, I will cut your head off and then I will take that entire army behind you and take them down as well, how much more so should we be able in the natural to stand in the face of sickness, fear, disease, corrupt government, fill in the blank, whatever it is that seems to trigger you and stand in front of it and say, I have covenant with a God that will not lie, will not fail, will not let me down. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. We have victory because of the covenant, because we overcome fear by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony. We don't love our lives in the face of death. The victory that David had what I love about this is we make a big deal. I'm wrapping up here. Um, Logan, come on up here and give me some acoustic guitar. Um, oh, he's holding a baby. I'm just kidding. Give me something, <laughs> JD. Um, what we have here in David's victory, we make a big deal about David and Goliath. But in reality, David's fight with Goliath took about 30 seconds. From what we can see in the scripture, it doesn't say that they both drew their swords out and they start like doing, you know, dual lightsaber kind of thing and they're like throwing down and Goliath knocks the sword out of David's hand and David jumps over there and grabs the sword. And, you know, it's none of that. It's literally Goliath is in the middle of talking smack. David reaches back, grabs one of his five smooth stones, puts it in the sling and just, and he's done. It was like, well, that was anticlimactic. That wouldn't make a really great movie. In fact, if you've seen, uh, there's a movie with Brad Pitt and he kind of does that move on a, uh, what was it? Troy, Troy. Like he gets in there and there's like this big warrior that comes up and Troy just grabs his spear and he just hits this little number. He's like, chik, 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 whoosh, and that's it. The guy just falls down. It's like, all right, that was the end of the fight. Thank you very much. He just turns around and goes home. That was essentially what happens with David. David gets the rock. I just imagine Goliath is still in the middle, in the middle of doing his monologue and David's like, shut up. Takes him out, walks over there, grabs the sword from Goliath, lops the dude's head off and he says, okay, that was a big battle as far as the world was concerned, but David really wasn't focused so much on Goliath. He's looking at the Philistine army beyond him. And church, what I wanna say to you today is that you have a small victory that seems like a big deal in mind, but God has greater victories that you haven't even seen. And these small victories are just the setup for the great thing that God has in store for you. It's just one battle after the next battle. It's one step of obedience that leads me to the next step of obedience. We serve a God of process. If we did not serve, I put it on the back of our men's shirt uh, this year. If we didn't serve a God of process, this book would basically look like, you know, he made the earth, man fell, he redeemed it, he returned, it was over. We could probably knock it all out like in a page, maybe two. It'd be a hefty, you know, trifold. That's about it. But no, we serve a God of process. It's bringing you from one small battle to the next big battle to a great victory that positions you for the next battle and the next victory and the one after that until Christ comes. And we do so because we are people that stand in covenant. We win the battles, we win the victories. We take it not for our own glory, but for the glory of our King. Church, the gathering has been established here for the last two years, not to build up Tyler and Lauren, not to build up all the great leaders that we have surrounding us in this room today, but this place has been established as a house where the glory of God will not only be welcome, it will be demanded. There is an expectation that I place on my God. What a crazy thing. I understand the covenant that I have with him, that I can place the expectation that my covenant making and my covenant keeping God will do everything that he says he will do in this word. I can hold him to that. Have you taken the time to study the terms of agreement that you have as followers of Christ? Stand to your feet with me.